the storm came through, the power's out, the internet is down. How will you communicate? Helping others and helping yourself are important principles of ham radio emergency communications. We'll tell you more coming up. This is ham radio. Hi, I'm Jim, N4BFR, the lead instructor at Ham Radio Prep. One of the reasons amateur radio exists is to be an auxiliary communication service. The FCC rules governing amateur radio highlight the value of our service. To quote them, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. That means many things to many people. People find ham radio emergency communications important for things like assisting when communications are interrupted. Think about getting messages out after a hurricane. Skills used when storms devastated Western North Carolina and Puerto Rico. Filling in gaps if communications go out. Giving places like hospitals and storm shelters ways to communicate and being able to reach out to loved ones at home or in a car. It's also public service communications. A great way to practice for an emergency is to deploy when off-grid communications are needed. Marathons, bike race, and off-road events are events that build that skill. To do it the right way, you will need three key things to get started. An amateur radio license. Different license levels have different operating privileges. Today, everyone starts with the entry-level technician license. That's just right for helping out in your community. If you don't have a license yet, check out the Ham Radio Prep Amateur Radio License courses. Equipment. You'll probably start with a handheld radio and work your way up. Handhelds are battery operated, and that's for more than just convenience. Off-grid power is a key feature of emergency communications equipment. As you build up your gear, you'll build your other skills. That brings us to training. You'll need to know skills like programming a radio, operating on a net, and how to relay messages. We have a whole course for you called MCOM 101. It covers those topics and how to get involved in different groups, and we'll cover those in a minute. There are two questions we always get related to emergency communications. Let's cover them now. People ask, why do I need a license? And can't I just pick up a radio in an emergency and start using it? We can use private pilot training for comparison. Pilots learn two ways. They do ground school, and then they fly for hours and hours before getting their license. In ham radio, Getting your license is like completing ground school. So that leaves the practical side. Would you want to take over flying a plane in an emergency with just ground school guidance? In the air, over who knows where, probably an emergency, may not be the best time for your first time at the controls. You want some experience before you sit in the pilot seat. Consider the same thing with amateur radio get some practice communicating before you need it. That'll make things a lot easier for you when things get tough. Let's talk about ham radio activations with a little more about practice. Hams love to practice their communication skills and groups may practice on their own. This may be called a set or simulated emergency test. They'll run through different scenarios to check their equipment and their planning. A more practical way to practice is through public service communications by helping out during actual activities. We know a group of hams that check in once a month to confirm their county's tornado sirens are activated. That's practicing their communication skills and helping the community stay safe. How about hams that roll out of bed at 4 a.m. on July 4th to help with the world's largest 10K. 
you'll find more than 50 hams along the route of the Peachtree Road Race in Georgia. They provide communications to water stops and call in for runner assistance. Those skills are built up and ready to be put into use when communications go out. Remember when Hurricane Helene struck Western North Carolina? Cell phones and internet connectivity were down for a wide area. Groups used a repeater on the top of Mount Mitchell to help coordinate with road closures and relief efforts. This is not the first time ham radio was used after a hurricane. A total of 22 hams traveled to Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. They staffed communications in small towns for weeks. Hams helped to ensure people could get critically needed supplies. It wasn't easy. Way Walker, K-A-E-A-B, was in that group, and they had a guiding principle during their stay. The one thing that was accurate about what the Red Cross people at the airport briefed us on was stay flexible. Nothing that you hear from us is going to be what you find it to be when you get there. So don't, don't be surprised if the, if the game plan changes every day, every minute, every hour. And that was pretty much accurate. Hams in Puerto Rico used a variety of skills. That's another important part of ham radio emergency communications. It's why we covered those types of materials in our MCOM 101 course. It's not just after storm activity for hams either. The National Weather Service works with hams in a number of ways. Hams on the ground can see things that their radar can't. We're the ground truth information. So if you're ever watching your local news and you hear that storm spotter, Skywarn Amateur Radio, has reported a tornado on the ground, wall clouds forming, flash floods, whatever. It's the spotters in the amateur radio community that have seen that and that have reported that to the National Weather Service office through the various means, whether it's amateur radio or direct phone calls. That's Lewis Long, KB8TCR, a Skywarn coordinator in Ohio. Skywarn tracks things like severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. They coordinate that information back to their local weather service offices. For hurricanes, the NWS relies in part on the Hurricane WatchNet. It feeds on the ground information back to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Hams in countries adjoining the Caribbean Sea regularly participate in these communications. Ham radio emergency communications take place across the ham bands. Local communications happen on VHF and UHF repeaters. Distant signals come in over HF. Some hams use higher frequencies to create digital networks as well. Look up ARDEN, that's the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. They operate between 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz and create digital Wi-Fi-like networks. Do not think you can just communicate anywhere you want because you claim it's an emergency. An Idaho man was fined $34,000 by the FCC for using forest service frequencies during a wildfire. Being well-trained and sticking to ham radio frequencies will help you avoid that. Emergency communications and amateur radio is not limited to just one coordinating group. We've told you a little about the weather-related groups. Here are two other types of organizations. For your town, county, or region, you will train and deploy with a local group. Those groups have names like Aries, Races, and Oxcom. They're all organized similarly for liaison with city, county, and state officials to deploy as part of larger responses. They're the groups that will host a simulated emergency test or support a bike race. You might also hear about CERT, which is a more technically oriented group. All these groups integrate training from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This helps standardize messages and roles during an event. There are also humanitarian groups you can volunteer with. These are organizations like the American Red Cross. Another is the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, known as SATURN. 
The Red Cross and Salvation Army understand the need for integrated communications. They deploy HAMS and others in communications roles. These communications groups are integrated into larger responses when they're needed. This is not an exclusive list. Just think of a group that deploys to support the community. More than likely, they need communicators. How about the Civil Air Patrol, which does search and rescue? Or REACT, they use HAM, CB, and even GMRS to communicate. If you have an interest, there may be a communications arm of your favorite group to work with. Many AMs get engaged just to help their community. There are others who want family communications. People ask questions like this all the time. I'm in Oklahoma City. How can I talk to my daughter in Arkansas if communications go out? This is a form of personal emergency communications. While we go deeper into this in our MCOM 101 course, there are three things to consider. What is your emergency power profile? Will you use batteries, a generator, or solar? However you communicate, you'll need to be able to power equipment for days or weeks in some scenarios. How will you get situational awareness information? Radios dedicated to receiving broadcast information are important. AM radios would let you listen to distant signals at night. FM will give you the local view. A weather radio might be even more important. Ones like this can tune in to the special National Weather Service broadcast frequencies. How will your family want to communicate? For our OKC to Arkansas family, there's a list of things they need. That includes getting their ham radio general level license and investing in HF equipment. If everyone in your household isn't ready to take the exam, consider something like GMRS, the General Mobile Radio Service. A single license covers your immediate family members and gives you a few miles of coverage. To get a GMRS license, just fill out a form with the FCC to get your call sign. It wouldn't take more than an afternoon and an Amazon shopping trip to get some of this gear in place and do a little practice too. If you're ready to start your journey in emergency communications, here's a checklist for you to work on. Get licensed and trained in communications. Ham Radio Prep has the technician level license course to get you started. From there, you can consider whether you need more training or if something like GMRS will also fit for you. You can get your ham license for less than $100. Get stocked up. Start with receivers, batteries, and maybe solar panels or a small generator. Consider how your power options will integrate with your radio equipment. Here's an example. Many handheld radios now charge via USB-C. Having a big battery pack with USB-C out can help charge radios and phones. For larger HF gear, you'll be looking into 12 volt battery options. As you decide what groups you might wanna work with, you'll expand your gear from there. For instance, if you join Skywarn, you'll probably want a mobile radio for your car. For the Hurricane WatchNet, you'll need radios and antennas that work on the HF bands. Get trained. Do not be the pilot who only knows ground school. Practice using your gear and advance your training. Join a group like Ares that'll have practice nets and deployments. Take our MCOM 101 course to find out how to program your handheld and where you fit into the MCOM universe. There are so many elements to amateur radio. You may decide you wanna go all in on emergency communications. Another person may be focused on optimizing Morse code. If you want more info on different topics, go to hamradioprep.com and see our other guides. If you want a deep dive with even more information, sign up for our Ham Radio Basics course. For now, I'm Jim N4BFR. We hope to hear you on the air soon, but hopefully not in an emergency.